Hello, I'm Amanda Edmiston and welcome to uh, part two of my very curious herbal as part, which I'm delivering as part of this fabulous virtual garden festival at Chawton House, or in my case here in Scotland. Um, I'm joining you now over afternoon tea. And if you saw the first session, uh, you'll know that I inspired to create this project by the work of an extraordinary woman, Elizabeth Blackwell, who in 1737 became the first woman to publish a herbal. I have chosen for my tea this afternoon some of the plants that Elizabeth was familiar with and drew for her herbal and wrote about. I, as part of this project, what I do is I'm, I, I look at the work Elizabeth created and I use it to take me on the journey to look at the legends surrounding those plants, how they were used in the early 18th century and how we use them now, um, what Elizabeth's experience of those plants would have been, the bit of the social history of the time and how it still um, is important to us today. Because this is a time of huge leaps and bounds in botany. As I mentioned earlier, this was a time when a vast array of plants were just being seen for the very first time on the British Isles. The great plant collectors had travelled afar and Sir Hans Sloan, who was one of Elizabeth Blackwell's supporters, um, is credited, for example, with bringing chocolate over to Britain. Now, I did have chocolate cake for my afternoon tea, but uh, someone round here has made off with it. Hopefully you've got some chocolate cake. Maybe you realise more during lockdown quite how important, valuable those tastes are. How they're not something maybe that we should be eating every day. This was so some, something Sir Hans Sloane would have been familiar with and may well have shared with Elizabeth Blackwell as he shared the recipe for hot chocolate, or so we're told, um, with the people he met in Britain. It's said, in fact, that he actually got a huge mass of his fortune by selling the recipe for chocolate that he learned from people in the Americas. But I think there's a little bit of um, a myth has grown up around that. He was a very successful doctor, as I mentioned earlier, and um, I'm sure he had many sources for his uh, vast wealth. Um, however, what he did do, certainly, was experience chocolate made a traditional way firsthand. It's said that chocolate actually was a gift from the gods, Quetzalcoatl gave it to the Toltec people, uh, one of the ancient Mayan peoples, and uh, he, as a result, somewhat fell out with the pantheon of gods in South America at the time, but he gave it to the people, and it was used for a long time with a far greater degree of uh, reverence than we, do, than we consume chocolate now. Um, Sir Hans Sloane also brought another far more familiar foodstuff with him back from the Americas and Elizabeth writes about this. She calls it the love apple. Now it has to be said that authorities at the time argued quite a lot over what we now describe as the tomato, the humble tomato, because Whilst Elizabeth is describing it as a love apple, a lot of people argue that it should be a wolf peach, like Podium Persicum. And Linnaeus, the, the sort of the father of, of order of plants, is um, currently, whilst Elizabeth is working, is, just to give you a little overview of the times that she's working in, is still gathering his data up in Sweden. He's travelling across Scandinavian countries and he's beginning to build up his theory about botanical order and the naming of names. Um, so the decision to 
to land with tomato and lycopodium persicum, the wolf peach, has not yet been established. In fact, Elizabeth's mention of the tomato is, is controversial at the time. It's another little insight into the extraordinary work this woman is creating. Because for a long time, tomatoes had been reviled and, and cast aside in Britain. They were not seen as a foodstuff. They were prized for their decorative value, but mostly shunned on the grounds that as a member of the Atropa family, a distant relative of the uh, far more malevolent Belladonna, known for its deadly effects, its association with um, witches' flying ointment. The tomato is, is seen as potentially poisonous. And Elizabeth does something extraordinary. She mentions that it can be eaten. And it is popular in the Mediterranean countries, served with a little oil in a salad, as we eat the cucumber. We associated the tomato across a lot of Britain at the time with the Northern European legend that witches used it to turn their enemies into werewolves. Well, it has to be said that tomatine, one of the uh, constituents in the humble tomato, can cause what herbalists these days describe as an inflammatory cascade, along with its other relatives, potatoes and aubergines, um, and an inflammatory cascade, can make you, amongst other things, quite angry, we describe it, in, in energetics as, as, you know, a heat that can result in, in skin disorders, digestive disturbances, and can aggravate PMT. One of the things that uh, I often mention as an aside that maybe gave a bit of, uh, fan the flames of the werewolf legend. But then she also mentions cucumber there. And if you have a look at A Curious Herbal, Elizabeth's original work, you may notice that the cucumber has changed quite a lot. Not in name so much, but just its appearance. That long, slim, uniform green fruit that we find en masse in every supermarket. Um did not resemble that in 1737. It was a lumpy creature. It was uh, differently shaped. We hadn't yet taken to growing it in tubes to give it uh, that, that long, slim uniformity we think of now. In fact, in Elizabeth's day, it was associated with enhancing male fertility. Now, it should also be mentioned as well as changing shape, the cucumber that we're familiar with now is also seedless. And it's the seeds that were used medicinally to help enhance um, the male ability to, to bear children um, or to start children off. <laughs> um, it's just now, I, please don't let me put you off your tea. Now, she does mention that cucumbers are eaten in salads, and she also talks about their ability to be cooling. And whilst as I say, we're now familiar with a bank of cucumbers greeting us as we walk into a greengrocer's. Even the cucumber was still quite an exotic foodstuff in Elizabeth's day. Due to the glass tax, greenhouses were not yet commonplace. Orangeries were really only available to the very wealthy and the elite. And cucumbers would have been very much a status symbol if served up for afternoon tea. Cucumbers had been a status symbol for a very long time by this point. The original greenhouse is said to have been um, created because um, an emperor had coveted them so much that he'd had his gardeners set up a, a covered bed 
on wheels so that they could shift it around to catch the sun. So other than Tiberius, the emperor who coveted the cucumbers, cucumbers were also said to have had a dramatic effect on the dynasty of Cambodia. The king of Cambodia is said to have favoured this cooling fruit so much that he had a dedicated cucumber gardener. Now, as I'm sure you all realise, the more royalty covets a foodstuff, the more popular it can become in fashionable society. And such was the case with the cucumber. It became the height of status symbol with the, um, the well-to-do classes of Cambodia. And the more popular it became, the more at risk anyone's cucumbers found themselves at being stolen. They started to reach higher and higher prices. The emperor was the king was quite concerned that his cucumbers might be stolen. So he decided to take the unprecedented step of arming his gardener. Now, as summer reached its peak and the long, humid nights drew in, sticky and sweaty, the more the king craved cucumbers. It got to the point where his gardener was so paranoid at someone stealing his master's cucumbers away that he stayed up all night, armed with a spear, ready to ward off any intruders intent on stealing the king's cucumbers. The king in his bedchamber got hotter and sweatier and started dreaming, thrashing about, craving nothing but cooling cucumbers. He decided to get out of bed one night, hot and sticky, and make his way down to the garden. Unfortunately, the gardener was waiting for such an intruder behind a wall and ran the king through with the spear. The king died. And you might think this is the end of the story, but there was a tradition in Cambodia at the time that the next ruler would be chosen by a particular elephant. The very next day, all the members of the royal household were lined up and the elephant was brought forth. It looked along the line of waiting people, anticipating the potential for them to step into the king's shoes and promptly pointed with its trunk to the gardener the Cucumber Gardener. And thus it was that the very dynasty of Cambodia was changed. This folktale, which is embedded in, in Cambodian culture, is kind of set in a time when, interestingly enough, the, um, the whole uh, ruling class of Cambodia did shift. It went from being a very high caste group to um, a far lower class um, group of people. So there is a hint of truth to this story of the cucumber king and the elephant. But it's worth remembering as we munch our way through the humble cucumber sandwich that we associate with afternoon tea and maybe eat a, a delicately carved piece of tomato. There's a little bit more to the fruits at tea time to meet the eye. Now, I don't know about you, but in Elizabeth Blackwell's day, in popular culture, in London society, well, and across the UK, coffee was by a very, by a long way, the most fashionable drink of choice. Coffee shops were opening up all over the place, and as I'm sure many of you know, they were the first, um, Lloyds of London, the great insurance company, started off as a conversation between gentlemen in a coffee house. Um, Hogarth and other great thinkers and artists of the day met up in coffee shops, well aware that that incredible effect coffee has on the adenosine receptors 
opening up the mind, making the ideas run quickly and fast, had the power to give them great ideas and take things forward. Now, it has to be said that I'm sure Elizabeth Blackwell was not drinking coffee in a coffee house. Uh, they had a somewhat tawdry reputation. Uh, Mole King's coffee shop in Covent Garden um, had a degree of licentious behaviour going on after hours. There was often quite a lot of heavy drinking taking place as well as the um, mind-opening qualities of coffee. Far less appropriate behaviour was going on. But Sir Hans Sloan and Lady Sloan, we know, both enjoyed a cup of coffee, so I'm sure she'd have got a sip of that incredible drink. It may be less commonly known that green tea was also being lauded. Elizabeth writes that this is a, an incredible food for restoring the digestion, that it has wonderful health benefits. We think of green tea as being a superfood popular today um, and we forget that this is something that has been hailed as having wonderful health benefits for well over 5,000 years. In fact, it was a Chinese emperor who um, for, is credited with discovering green tea. He was not only a brilliant ruler but he was also said to be a very keen scientist and a supporter of the arts. He is said to have been the person who first advocated boiling water to make sure that there were no um, harm, harmful bacteria in the water. And whenever he travelled, he would get his servants to brew him up boiling water. That's how he came across green tea. His servants, one hot summer, as he was travelling, went off and bo boiled the emperor up a cup of hot boiling water and some fresh green leaves fell into his cup. Instead of being angry, the insightful emperor smelled that incredible refreshing fragrance and felt compelled to take a sip. He felt it was having a positive effect on his system and from that day on he advocated the drinking of green tea. Of course it's then said to have travelled from China to Japan and eventually to Europe and the Americas. But um, it's interesting to think how many things we forget have been popular for so long. Green tea was enjoyed in Elizabeth Blackwell's day along with coffee. It's not a new story to tell when we claim of its wonderful health benefits. So to finish off with today, I thought I'd share a look at coffee. For those of you who, who've set aside the green tea and, and prefer the sharp, stimulating effect of a black coffee, I'd love to share how that plant became one that was a popular drink. It started in Ethiopia a very long time ago and there was a young shepherd boy out herding his goats. He noticed that although many of the animals around him and the people would settle down to sleep in the heat of the midday sun, the goats would turn to the dark red berries of a certain plant and become lively and animated. He decided he would share this bit of information with the monks at his local monastery. He took the berries in and told them about how his goats became animated and playful and the monks sent for the abbot. He took one look at the goats and pronounced that these were not the work of God but the work of the devil and cast them into the fire. Whereupon an amazing aroma was emitted and the abbot rather hastily said that he'd got it wrong. These were not the work of Satan, these were a gift from God. The berries were grasped out, plunged into cold water to help assuage the heat and preserve their wonderful scent. And as the abbot sipped, 
he thought to himself how useful they may be at allowing his monks to pray and study long into the night and pronounced them a worthy drink. Claudia Roden remarks that they were used in uh, Yemen for hundreds of years um, in, in ceremonies and were revered as a, as a very special ingredient. And, you know, they did open up intellectual society in a huge way as Elizabeth Blackwell was working. But um, I'm going to finish off my cup of tea and maybe enjoy my cucumber sandwich. Maybe go and find out what happened to that chocolate cake and make sure that um, my, my children <laughs> aren't underestimating the importance of chocolate and quite how special it is. Hopefully you've enjoyed finding out a bit more about the origins of the plants that Elizabeth Blackwell studied and drew. And I will be back for another session later on when we tie in a little bit more of some of the stories surrounding the plants and the times Elizabeth Blackwell was working in. Thank you all very much and I'll see you later. <laughs>